Sure, I remember that meeting. It was on the 24th of May in 1960. We were all there. The planet was exploding. In Chile, an earthquake had broken the Earth's crust over a length of 1,200 kilometers. Mountains and islands disappeared and volcanoes spit lava. A giant tsunami reached Hawaii and our west coast. The devastation was terrible. It was the apocalypse. It happened without warning. Just a week before, we were so happy. We had shut down the summit on disarmament with a surgical intelligence operation that was so great. What had happened? Ah, this Bolshevik, Nikita Khrushchev, made us lose patience. He had proposed a broad disarmament in the United Nations General Assembly. Imagine, disarmament for us would mean the loss of billions in profits. Our military industry dominated the world. And now, lose all of that for this fucking communist? Impossible. We had to stop it. How did you do it? Well, we made traps. We sent spy planes at a height over Russia that was impossible for them not to know it, not to detect it. Then, while our president was wasting time in the summit, we sent bombers with explosives to Argentina for nuclear testing. So, when the whole world expected proposals from the heads of states on world peace, Eisenhower showed that he did not care and mocked everyone? Well, we expected the Russians to get angry about the provocations, but not even our European allies were really worried. Then we arrested some of his spies during the Khrushchev speech at the United Nations one year before. How? Did you arrest the spies with a warrant or did you take them as hostages? Was that in order to blackmail Khrushchev to withdraw his disarmament proposal? Uh, it wasn't very legal, but we had no choice. The Russians also offered a peace treaty to a unified and neutral Germany. But we have our missiles there in Germany. Khrushchev proposed the peace treaty to create a unified Germany to put an end to the Second World War. And in his diabolical plan, he wanted to present to the world the two wanted Nazis. Why diabolic? During the World War, you and the Soviets fought together against the Nazis. And presenting war criminals like Eichmann and Mengele to the competent courts was a good idea. We were not interested in the Nazis any longer. Some worked for us, but that plan would have violated our interests. We were not willing to end the Cold War, and Khrushchev wanted to use the detention of the two Nazis as propaganda. Khrushchev sent his agents to Argentina. Those agents were from Israel. For us, it was really funny. They did not even inform their superiors within Mossad. Of course, by that time, Ben-Gurion negotiated with the German government a huge amount for the construction of a nuclear power plant in exchange for not talking about the Holocaust. Yeah, that deal was agreed to in New York. We taped everything. At the beginning, we wanted to stop that agreement because our diplomatic relations with Israel were very dry and we wanted no nuclear weapons in the Near East. Israeli services had better relations with the Soviets than with the CIA. It was not like today. The Soviet military intelligence had two high-ranking spies within the Israeli government. Sure, we had our oil interest in the region, but we considered the Israeli fantasies of a kibbutz life as communist. Then everything changed and we tolerated the Israeli nuclear option. But in May of 1960, we stopped those Soviet spies in Argentina. Those Israelis were real idiots, amateurs. They entered into Argentina through a clandestine airport in a plane that was ours. Did you intervene? It was easy. 
We gave him a few taps and detained all of them, the Israelis and their prisoner, the Nazi. We kept them in captivity during the days of the summit. In order to convince Khrushchev not to continue with his fantasies on disarmament. And he got the message. He kept silent. And finally, we dispatched the Israelis with their Nazi to Ben Gurion to have fun with them. We thought they were going to execute them. But he did not. Ben Gurion welcomed them like heroes and brought Eichmann to a spectacular trial. Then there was an accident. Our test in Argentina ended in catastrophe. Thousands of people died. Our fault, we thought. We had to cover everything. This interview was not real. I invented it. But what happened in May 1960 could have occurred in that way. Why did the summit conference of the former allies in World War II fail? The proposals of the Soviet Union were global disarmament, reunification of Germany and a new world order. Hardly peanuts. We are at the Buenos Aires Lake in the far south of Argentina. Here originates the Rio Deseado, the desired river, that crosses from the Andes 600 kilometers through the Santa Cruz province until it finally flows into the Atlantic Ocean near Puerto Deseado. However, the port city is making no progress due to the lack of drinking water. During the last ice age, parts of the riverbed of the Rio Deseado were covered with lava. The residents of Puerto Deseado always dreamed of an aqueduct to connect the Buenos Aires Lake with their city. In 1960, the Argentine Navy had a plan, in their eyes a brilliant plan. They wanted to restore the original river course again and dig a channel in the volcanic rock. But this was a gigantic task. What luck that they had some friends who offered their services, their friends at the Pentagon. They also wanted to build a canal, a second canal through Central America, a huge business. And what a coincidence, the friends from the Pentagon had already finished construction plans, brilliant plans, they said. For the excavation of the navigable canal, they did not want to use conventional explosives, but atomic bombs. After detonation, a proper number of craters were left without any rocks. What bad luck that the Pentagon was in such a hurry that it had forgotten a detail. That underground explosions release energy and cause seismic movements, earthquakes. Southern Latin America is a volcanic region, and when they burned the fuse to obtain their desired craters, the earth moved. On the other side of the Andes, in Chile, the quake had a magnitude of 9.5 degrees on the Richter scale, the largest ever registered. The tsunami reached California, Hawaii, and the Philippines. Thousands died, millions were left homeless. The disaster was total. But until today, the U.S. government hides its responsibility. In 1959, the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev called at the United Nations for an end of the arms race and for an end of nuclear testing. And he offered a peace treaty for a united and neutral Germany. This proposal should be discussed and concluded at a summit conference in May 1960 in Paris by the victorious allies of World War II. The government of General Dwight Eisenhower and the military industrial complex was against this offer. They wanted to preserve their technological superiority, and an end of the Cold War would have shaken their supremacy. How did they manage to bring about the failure of the summit? There is an official version and a story that has never been told. According to official history, the summit in Paris failed because of Khrushchev's anger. Related to the U-2 incident, that spy plane of the CIA. According to the official history, the Soviets alone are responsible for the division of Germany. The official history denies the existence of nuclear tests in Patagonia, invents an heroic kidnapping of a Nazi war criminal by Israeli agents 
and describes the earthquake in Chile as a natural event. The author of the official version was the National Security Council of the United States. The council proceeded like the Ministry of Truth, as the British writer George Orwell described in his book 1984. The real events were hidden and mass media spread disinformation. The Security Council met on May 24, 1960. It was chaired by President Eisenhower. At the table were sitting his generals and ministers, John McCone of the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, and Alan Dulles, head of the CIA. The minutes were secret for decades. They discussed how they should behave if the Congress wanted to investigate their operations, how they brought the Soviet proposals to failure. A true intelligence fabric had been built around the summit conference, mentioned in the minutes, consisting of several provocations. Shortly before the summit, a U-2 spy plane violated Russian airspace at an altitude that made it impossible for the Soviet air defense not to detect it. On the eve of the summit, in the U.S. sirens were howling nationwide. For Khrushchev, a threat. Definitely, the operation was not a friendly prelude to a meeting of world powers. While Eisenhower was staying at the disarmament summit, his generals arrived in Argentina with four aircraft carriers full of nuclear explosives. They wanted to conduct nuclear tests, said the newspaper. These tests, however, were at that time prohibited by the U.S.-Soviet moratorium. During the summit, the CIA took Russian hostages, like one year earlier during Khrushchev's speech to the UN. This story is really complicated. It happened in different places. The summit in France, Paris, the proposal of reunification and a peace treaty, Moscow, Bonn, Berlin, the secret tests of a new nuclear weapon in the south of Argentina. Here is Buenos Aires and here is Puerto Deseado. And here is the Buenos Aires Lake. Then we have the transfer of a high-ranking Nazi official from Argentina to Israel and the earthquake in Chile. Everything happened in May of 1960 and everything is related to everything. With the end of World War II, a race for obtaining the atomic bomb began. Billions went into the creation of a military-industrial complex, especially in the U.S. In the Nevada desert, a testing ground for over- and underground nuclear tests was built. A complete ghost town was built there in order to investigate the effects of a nuclear war. The Atomic Energy Commission, AEC, under the direction of John McCone, wanted to teach the people how they have to behave in case of a Soviet nuclear attack. Many people at that time feared that the Cold War could turn into a hot war and make the entire planet uninhabitable. The Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev knew that he would not win the arms race. His country too spent vast amounts on armaments, capital it needed to modernize its industrial infrastructure. At the time, Russia was still suffering from the consequences of World War II, which had claimed the lives of more than 25 million Russians. In September 1959, Khrushchev visited the United States. In the General Assembly of the United Nations, he called for a total disarmament of all states within four years. He met President Eisenhower at Camp David. In public, Eisenhower spoke in favor of a policy of peace and Khrushchev believed him. But confidential documents of the White House show that he was highly skeptical about the prospects of disarmament. Eisenhower was a general and was afraid of losing advantages. His military apparatus was technologically superior to the Soviet Union, and the end of the tests would have threatened the superiority. Three and a half million people worked in the military-industrial complex and arms control would have cost many of their jobs. But public opinion was alarmed due to the fallout, not only in the U.S., but also throughout the world. 
the atmosphere was poisoned by radioactive particles. In October 1958, the United States and the Soviet Union pledged to refrain from further nuclear tests. This moratorium was, for John McCone, head of AEC and hardliner within the Security Council, a tragedy. With respect to test suspension, it must be recognized that we are suffering a severe restriction in our weapons development program. No progress in new or improved weapons is being made, and our vital interests are therefore being adversely affected. The long continuation of the Geneva test suspension negotiation would have very damaging effects on the Commission, the staff, and the laboratories, and I did not feel that I could be responsible for this deterioration, John McCone. At that time, Germany was divided into the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic. The wall had not been built yet. In May 1945, roten die Gewehre. Der Krieg war zu Ende. Deutschland war besetzt. Nun mussten Zonen gebildet werden, Besatzungszonen. Weeks later, the victorious Allied powers met in Potsdam. Für die Sowjetunion Stalin, für Großbritannien Churchill, für die Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika Truman. Diese drei diskutierten und entschieden, was mit Deutschland, mit Polen sein wird. Hier wurden die Einflusssphären festgelegt, hier wurde das Potsdamer Abkommen geschlossen. Schon seit den 30er Jahren wurde eine neue Dimension einer Waffe diskutiert, geprüft und entwickelt. Nukleare Waffen. Nun gab es im Mai 1945 einen Frieden, einen Kriegsschluss in Europa, aber eben nur in Europa. Der Krieg zwischen Japan und USA hielt noch an. Und während hier die Sphären aufgeteilt wurden, hier in Potsdam, fiel die Entscheidung im Erlenbachhaus im Sitz der Amerikaner auf Japan zwei Atombomben zu werfen auf Nagasaki und Hiroshima. 100.000 Menschen starben bei diesem Angriff. Rainer Rupp was a top agent of the GDR in NATO's headquarters in Brussels. Für mich hat der Kalte Krieg mit dem Abwurf der beiden US Atombomben auf Hiroshima und Nagasaki Ende 1945 begonnen, denn inzwischen äh, hat sich gezeigt, auch nach US-amerikanischer Aktenlage, dass der Abwurf militärisch absolut sinnlos war, hatte kein, keinen Zweck zu erfüllen. Er beschleunigte auch nicht, wie der Mythos geht, die Kapitulation der äh, japanischen Armee. Aber, und das geht eben auch aus diesen Akten hervor, er sollte den großen, den, der Sowjetunion, dem zukünftigen Feind der USA, sollte er zeigen, welch, über welchen großen Knüppel die Vereinigten Staaten verfügen, um den praktisch um Russland im Zaum zu halten. Ja, Deutschland ist an der Atombombe gearbeitet worden. So bekannte Namen sind, sind Heisenberg und Weizsäcker. Die haben aber eine ziemlich unklare Rolle gespielt und am weitesten gekommen sind Namen, das sind Leute, die der Name man heute kaum kennt, Diebner ist der eine und Bagge ist der zweite. Die sind immerhin gekommen bis zu Testexplosionen auf deutschem Boden, wo auch KZ-Häftlinge so zur Probe umgebracht worden sind, erfolgreich. Also da ist einiges passiert und das hätte nicht viel gefehlt. Ein paar Monate vielleicht, dass, dass das ganz anders ausgegangen wäre, die Geschichte. Aber man hatte halt also Anfang der 50er Jahre, nach, nach ein paar Jahren Informationssperre, dann doch Fotografien von Hiroshima und Nagasaki zum Beispiel in den Medien. Und die Leute sahen, was, was Atomwaffen anrichteten. Und die führenden Leute, also Eisenhower zum Beispiel, die hatten einfach Angst dafür, Angst davor, wenn die Bevölkerung das wirklich kapiert, dann ist diese dieser Weg, Weg verstopft. Und da hat man dann alle möglichen netten Anwendungsfälle sich ausgedacht, also Autos oder Flugzeuge und, und eben auch diese, diese friedlichen Explosionen ähm, verschiedenster Art. Ähm, weil aus den meisten Dingen ist, ist nichts geworden, die sind heute Lachnummern, aber damals war das so. Und die friedlichen Explosionen, 
die hat es dann doch in einigen, äh, in einigen Ausführungen gegeben, sowohl bei den Amerikanern als auch bei den Russen. Es setzte ein Ping-Pong-Spiel, eine Rüstungsspirale ein, auch auf dem nuklearen Sektor. Die Sowjetunion schloss relativ schnell zu den Amerikanern auf, andere Staaten folgten. Until the end of 1958, the United States, Great Britain and the Soviet Union had carried out 210 nuclear tests. Doctors and scientists warned of the fallout. In Nevada, the AEC examines the effects of radioactive particles. Die Hysterie war überall. Ich erinnere an die Aufklärungsfilme aus den USA, wo sich Personen beim Atomangriff unter einem Tisch verstecken sollten oder eine Aktentasche auf den Kopf legen sollten, wie auch umgekehrt an die unglaublich breite anti atom der 50er Jahre. Die Gesellschaft hat kurz nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg erheblich darauf reagiert. Zunächst ziemlich wirkungslos, zeigt aber, dass der Kalte Krieg unglaublich heiß gestrickt worden ist zwischen den zwei großen Imperien, USA und Sowjetunion. Nun waren die USA gar nicht so erfreut, dass es diese Abrüstungsgipfel gegeben hat. Sie hatten einen technologischen Vorsprung gewisserweise vor der Sowjetunion und haben befürchtet, diesen zu verlieren, gewisserweise verständlich. Sie wurden aber am Ende dann doch an den Verhandlungstisch gezwungen. Ja, das ist richtig. Die USA hatte einen Vorsprung, musste aber relativ schnell äh, verstehen, dass sie insgeheim nachrichtendienstlich Abflüsse hatte, so dass die Sowjetunion gut aufschließen konnte. Heiß war die Phase in den 50er Jahren immer, insbesondere wegen des im Jahr 1957 erfolgten Sputnik-Schocks. Eine Interkontinentalrakete konnten die Sowjets also in den Weltraum schießen. Das heißt, das Bauern- und Bergarbeitervolk war doch nicht so ungeschickt, solche hochtechnologischen Prozesse in den Griff zu bekommen. The US government failed to stop the global protests and had to sign a nuclear test ban. Dieses ähm, Moratorium betrifft äh, die, die, das Verbot äh, des, ähm, der, von Atombombenversuchen in der Atmosphäre. Ähm, hier hatte sich aufgrund der praktisch ungebremsten Atomwaffenversuche in den USA, aber auch in der Sowjetunion, äh, zur, zum Testen und zur Entwicklung von immer neuen und, und stärkeren Nuklearwaffen, hatte sich im Laufe der Jahre eine ernstzunehmende Vergiftung der äh, Atmosphäre ergeben. Allerdings die daran geknüpften Hoffnungen, dass das auch ein Ende der Nuklearversuche wären, beziehungsweise die Entwicklung dieser schrecklichen Massenvernichtungswaffe, die Weiterentwicklung begrenzen oder stoppen würde, die war vergeblich. Denn schnell kam man dazu, wie man weitermachen kann. Man stieg ganz einfach auf unterirdische Versuche um und äh, versuchte es dann a, einerseits mit immer größeren Waffen, aber zur selben Zeit, wie ich schon vorhin erwähnte, äh, äh, hat man dann vorrangig kleinere taktische Nuklearwaffen ausprobiert, die man entweder zur, Be zur Führung von begrenzten Nuklearkriegen, äh, äh, taktisch, taktischen Nuklearkriegen äh, am Schlachtfeld einsetzen konnte oder aber auch für angebliche zivile Zwecke, nämlich um Flüsse zu verlegen, um, um, um Kanäle durch Berge zu sprengen etc. Und also auf jeden Fall, die Entwicklung der Atomwaffen ging weiter. One year earlier, in 1957, the AEC set up the Project Plowshare, also known as Program Bombs for Peace. It had nothing in common with the pacifist biblical concept of transforming swords into plowshares. The AEC wanted to avoid the impending ban on nuclear weapons tests with the supposedly civil application of nuclear explosive power. The spiritual fathers of plowshare were the physicists Herbert York and Edward Teller. 
Teller was criticized among his colleagues because he had appeared as a witness against the physicist Robert Oppenheimer. The House Un-American Activities Committee of Senator Joseph McCarthy had opened an investigation against Oppenheimer, who had spoken in favor of arms control. Oppenheimer um, uh, had uh, on der Entwicklung, uh, bei der Entwicklung der Wasserstoffbombe Probleme bekommen und hat um, versucht, Argumente zu finden, das nicht, nicht weiter zu treiben in der Richtung. Und es bestand der Verdacht, dass er kommunistische Verbindungen hatte und da ist er halt in diese McCarthy-Geschichte reingerutscht. Und Edward Teller, sein, einer seiner engsten Kollegen, ist, hat sich da nicht entblödet, da aufzutreten und ihn entsprechend äh, madig zu machen. Das hat ihm große Schwierigkeiten bereitet. Aber auch Teller hat dabei bei seinen Physikerkollegen äh, Federn lassen müssen. Also die fanden, viele fanden das nicht gut, jetzt diesen McCarthy-Ausschuss auf diese Weise zu unterstützen. Teller ist, ähm, hat halt, wenn man seine Biografie anguckt, äh, an, an vielen Stellen äh, eine negative Rolle gespielt. Er hat all die, die üblen ähm, Wege, die die Physik machen konnte in der, in der Physik, in der Kernphysik insbesondere, hat er versucht zu propagieren. Also bei der Wasserstoffbombe ist, äh, ging das los, dann ähm, später hat er sich dafür eingesetzt, friedliche nukleare Explosionen zu machen, also für, für friedliche Zwecke zum Hafen bauen oder Kanäle bauen. Äh, hat überhaupt nicht daran gedacht, dass das auch Radioaktivität freisetzt, die Leute äh, kaputt macht und wer weiß, was für Folgen hat. Ähm, dann hat er bei SDI mitgebracht, mitgemacht. Ähm, Regen hat das äh, zu einem seiner Lieblingsthemen gemacht, auch durch, durch Edward Teller. Ein physikalisch sehr fragwürdiges Unternehmen, militärisch, katastrophal. Plowshare started with the Chariot Project, the construction of a port in Alaska. The plan was to excavate the harbor basin with atomic explosives. The indigenous people learned about it and protested. The plan was never realized. More realistic was the second plan, a new canal in Central America. The State Department was worried about the Panama Canal zone and looked for an alternative, a new waterway, fast and cheap. The Panama Canal Company had already finished construction plans. All that has been lacking was testing the new technology. In addition to the Chariot program, it would be desirable to detonate two or three low-yield nuclear explosives at scaled depth of about 100 to 200 feet in media typical of a canal route. The canal could be built faster and much cheaper with atomic bombs compared with an excavation with conventional explosives. A nuclear bomb leaves a clean crater without debris that must be removed costly and time-consuming. The company thought of something like a pearl necklace through atomic detonations in a row and in certain distance, so that in the end they needed only to connect the craters. The AEC knew from their tests in Nevada that underground explosions trigger seismic movements. McCone suspected that the Russians too conducted secret nuclear tests in the ground, and he worked on a tool to distinguish a natural earthquake from a man-made one, caused by blasting bombs. Therefore, he needed a network of several appropriately located stations to collect seismic signals. The Soviets did not like the idea because they feared espionage, but finally they agreed to it in the Geneva negotiations. In January 1960, Teller introduced the AEC his new invention, the Ditch Digger, a kind of underground milling machine, able to cut the rocks with small nuclear bombs. This engine should be tested now. Therefore, the AEC argued that in Geneva, the civilian use of nuclear energy must be excluded from the test ban. The committee urges that the ditch digger program, including field experiments to test the ditch digger principle, be initiated as rapidly as possible. The committee strongly recommends that every attempt be made to provide additional funds to the plowshower program so that the ditch digger experiment can be carried out at an early date. For Eisenhower, disarmament negotiations were already annoying but he was in the middle of the election campaign and he tried to be shown publicly in the best light and not as the one responsible for the failure of disarmament. 
Mikona advised him to continue the negotiations because the prospects of a successful conclusion of the negotiations were so remote that no serious risk was involved. The official history blames only the Soviet side for the division of Germany, despite all the initiatives of the Kremlin to set that issue on the agenda. Diesen Vorschlag hatte es ja von sowjetischer Seite schon unmittelbar nach Kriegsende gegeben und also für eine äh, Lösung für Deutschland nach dem, äh, nach dem Vorbild äh, für, äh, für Österreich, also ein vereintes Deutschland, ähm, allerdings neutral. In den 50er Jahren gab es tatsächlich im Raum stehend noch unter Stalin die Erwägung, äh, Deutschland ganz gänzlich anders aufzustellen. Es gab die Diskussion um ein neutrales Deutschland, es gab die berühmte Stalin-Note vom März 1952. An diesen Faden knüpfte Khrushchev in verschiedensten Formen an. Er wollte dieses verfluchte West-Berlin-Problem loswerden, weil die DDR war nicht zu halten mit so einem Stück Teilstaat mittendrin. Er hat mehrere Initiativen gestartet, so oder so, und der Höhepunkt war sicherlich jener Mai 1960 in Paris. Nun, der Gipfel, glaube ich, sollte zwei Dinge bewegen. Einerseits stand einfach die Frage an, das deutsche Problem muss gelöst werden. Und die Kernfrage innerhalb der deutschen Problematik war immer West-Berlin. Denn es gab inzwischen zwei Staaten, es hatte sich in dem Sinne ja eine Entwicklung vollzogen, die von beiden Seiten akzeptiert war. Die Bundesrepublik Deutschland gehörte mit all dem, was nun mal in diesen Zusammenhängen gehörte, der NATO an. Und die Deutsche Demokratische Republik war mit ihren Streitkräften Teil des Warschauer Vertrages, sodass eigentlich die, ich möchte sagen, die Nadelspitze immer bis Berlin blieb. The Russian plan, a peace treaty for a reunified and neutral Germany, had chances of success. The French and the British always were afraid of the German militarism and preferred a neutral Germany. The opposition Labour Party agreed on the plan, according to a telex of the German embassy in London. The Labour Party called on the British government to accept the offer of the Soviet Union for the nuclear tests ban for two to three years. They suggested the withdrawal of all foreign military forces from Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, the German Democratic Republic, and the Federal Republic of Germany. They advocated reunification of Germany and the withdrawal of the Federal Republic from NATO and of the three eastern states from the Warsaw Pact. In the Federal Republic, this plan was supported by the illegal Communist Party and by the Liberal Party, FDP. The FDP submitted a legislative proposal for a referendum on a peace treaty. This agreement should not include any humiliating conditions and no major territorial losses. It should include a general amnesty for treason during the war, for the Nazis, but also for the agents of the Allies. The proposal rejected the shameful obligation to maintain on its own soil foreign monuments that remember the most painful defeat. From abroad, German citizens should be repatriated, among them the escaped Nazis. The new reunified Germany should commit itself not to belong to any military alliance and not to tolerate any foreign troops. All Central Europe should be free from nuclear weapons. The Nazi exile in Argentina received the Soviet plan enthusiastically. Their leader in Argentina, Hans Ulrich Rudel, called for a rebirth of our fatherland. There is neither an American nor a Russian Germany. There is only a German Germany. The State Department knew that the Soviets had close ties to ultra-right-wing circles in Argentina. They were united in their anti-Americanism. Argentine neo-Nazis generally are hostile to the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Some neo-Nazi leaders advocate collaboration with the communists and were negotiating with Soviet representatives. Chancellor Konrad Adenauer rejected the idea of a unified and neutral Germany totally. He did not even want to discuss the legislative proposal of the FDP.
The Liberal Party begins with a false assumption that does not exist in reality. A withdrawal from NATO and from the troops of the Western powers is a very risky path. We would not gain anything politically, but lose our most effective security guarantees. Es stand auch die Frage über eine Konföderation zunächst eine Annäherung zu erreichen, aber die dann auch dazu führen sollte, dass äh, dieses dann mal vereinte Deutschland eben nicht den einem militärischen Block angehört, sondern dass dann auch die Tatsache entstehen sollte, beide Blöcke sollten einen Verzicht für die Aufnahme eines Vereinten Deutschlands abgeben. Also nicht der NATO und auch nicht dem Warschauer Pakt angehören. So ist das. Ähm, wie hätte das denn dann ausgesehen? Wie hätte das realisiert werden können in Paris? Ja, in Paris äh, hätte das nur der Beginn von Verhandlungen sein können. Aber warum ist denn dieses Thema, ein neutrales Gesamtdeutschland, nicht einmal diskutiert worden in Paris? Ja, weil ich denke, die westliche Seite dazu nicht bereit war. The Russians plan was a confederation of the two Germanys, a national referendum, a peace treaty and the German military outside of NATO and the Warsaw Pact. With a capital in Berlin, free and without military, denazification of the public administration and a general amnesty for all war crimes. Only the persons for whom arrest warrants had been issued should be brought to the courts. There were two, the Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele and the SS official Adolf Eichmann, both living in Buenos Aires. If these two persons came to the courts voluntarily or not, the chapter of World War II could be closed. A document from the German Federal Intelligence Service, BND, that I got through a lawsuit, reports on the Soviet plan. French circles of the extreme right are arguing with particular emphasis that in the kidnapping of Eichmann, the Israeli intelligence agency served only as a cover. The plan was to transfer him in the moment that Khrushchev stated that the German Democratic Republic would renounce any participation of former Nazis in the administration. Eichmann had already prepared an extensive list of former Nazis who currently are serving the Eastern services. And the right moment was the summit in May 1960 in Paris. Argentina at that time was governed by the left wing of the radical civic union, UCR. Arturo Frondizi had won the elections thanks to an agreement with the exiled Juan Domingo Perón. Frondizi had been lawyer of the International Red Aid that supported persecuted communists and was controlled from Moscow. He was a follower of the theory of dependency and development, as well as his close collaborator Rogelio Frigerio, a former member of the communist group Insurrexit. The Argentine military was hostile to Frondizi's government. Its members suspected him for his contacts to communists and Peronists, as well as for the fact that several Jews were in his cabinet. David Blecher, Samuel Schmuckler and Mazar Barnett. Frondizi knew the Catholic bishop of San Isidro, Antonio Aguirre, of the group Pilar, progressive clergy who were preparing the Second Vatican Council. O sea, políticamente era un hombre claramente de derecha, pero en la iglesia era un hombre renovador, que se encuadró totalmente en la renovación que proponía Juan XXIII, Y en el Concilio Vaticano II lideró uno de los grupos argentinos que estaba en esa línea renovadora. Aguirre maintained close contacts with the family of Ernesto Che Guevara, as is shown in his private address book that is kept in the secret archives of the cathedral. The Argentine Intelligence Service considered Aguirre and the bishops of the group Pilar as communists too. They tapped the phones of the clergy and of the members of the Frondizi cabinet. The military was a parallel power, which was waiting for a favorable moment for their next coup. In Argentina, a state of emergency had been declared, and political prisoners were tortured. Ideologically, Frondizi was an anti-fascist, and he did not like the Nazis who had immigrated during Perón's governments. They were protected by the military. Against Joseph Mengele, 
docked during the Auschwitz concentration camp, a German arrest warrant was pending, and the foreign office in Bonn prepared an extradition request. Frondizi had instructed his three intelligence agencies to look for Mengele's whereabouts, but they reported that their investigation had unfortunately no result. This was communicated by the foreign office to the German ambassador in Buenos Aires, who concluded, An extradition request will therefore have only theoretical value. President Frondizi was embarrassed because he had to admit that his secret agencies were not under his control. The German embassy knew perfectly where Mengele was. A few years ago, Mengele had received a German passport under his real name and address. So, an employee of the consular staff called him on the phone and got him immediately on the line. Mengele was doing business under his real name in the center of Buenos Aires, two days before the Argentine police got the order to search for him. That was in January 1960. Probably the German diplomats gave Mengele's address to the Argentine government so they could act. In Paris, meanwhile, the summit was prepared. The positions hardened. Eisenhower and Adenauer absolutely rejected the Soviet proposals, but they could not admit this publicly without running the risk of being blamed as opponents of reunification. So they initiated a dispute over formalities. The United States proposed a peace treaty with the previously unified Germany, while the Soviet Union proposed a peace treaty with the two separate states, West Germany and East Germany, which should then decide for themselves. We expect no solution from the summit. In December, Khrushchev had even threatened to sign a separate peace treaty with the German Democratic Republic, reported State Secretary Christian Herder in the U.S. Senate. And John McCohn added, it is the opinion of the Department of State that West Germany has concluded that they would not wish to press for reunification. Within NATO, there were different opinions about the test ban. The French government was against it because de Gaulle wanted to develop his own nuclear force. But the conservative British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, was in favor. Comment of McCone. President Eisenhower refused the proposal. If his views prevail, then the government will finally move to the basis AEC position. Macmillan wanted to save the conference in any way possible. In March, two months before the summit, he visited Eisenhower. But the two leaders could not agree. Eisenhower did not want to give up the development of new weapons and accept restrictions in Paris. Even Adenauer saw the conference with concern. He feared that the French and British could buckle. The situation could change when once they are sitting at the round table, without knowing in advance how far we want to go. In April, the Western foreign ministers worked out counter-proposals in order to gain time. Eventually, they wanted a referendum about the question whether the Germans want to have first the reunification and then the peace treaty or vice versa. Referring to Berlin, there were various options on the table. One was to transform the unified city into its own German state. Another, to put West Berlin under the protection of U.S. troops. A third was to transform West Berlin into a U.S. protectorate, or to declare Berlin as a sovereign town with the protection of Allied troops. For the German Federal Foreign Office, any change of the status quo was not desirable. The worst option was the Russian, to transform Berlin into a free and demilitarized city. We have come to the conclusion that each of the above mentioned options would bring us more serious disadvantages than potential benefits. Only one option was acceptable. An agreement that will change the current status only slightly and only in procedural matters. For Adenauer, even the proposals of U.S. Secretary of State Herder were too soft. He wanted to tell the Soviets that they cannot have both, detent policy and their own way to Berlin. This is a clumsy wording and can be interpreted with the conclusion that the Soviets may have Berlin. For the Foreign Office in Bonn, Herder lacked a sense of reality. He overestimated the practical value of moral positions in politics and underestimated the Soviet aspirations for power and expansionism. Herder asked the federal government if they put emphasis on the presence of Western troops in Berlin. 
Adenauer was terrified. One month before the summit, Herder sent secret information to the Germans. That Khrushchev will provoke a crisis. Herder did not give details about this crisis, but the federal government was convinced that the summit will not come to a good end. That was on the 13th of May, three days before the opening. The decision was taken to produce a crisis in order not to talk at the summit about German reunification and global disarmament. They used several provocations. The first was a CIA spy plane. According to information from the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in the recent days an incident has occurred involving an American reconnaissance aircraft, which was probably flown from Turkey into Soviet airspace. With regard to the summit, the foreign ministry tried to suppress reports about the incident. Disaster, this time diplomatic, befell the American U-2 spy... Somehow, the message became known, and it was announced that on May 1st, the Soviet air defenses shot down an American U-2 spy plane and had arrested the pilot, CIA agent Gary Powers. The official history describes the U-2 incident as the only reason for the failure of the summit, although the internal reports of the CIA say the opposite. On May 5th, Khrushchev opened the first session of a meeting of the Supreme Soviet. In his remarks, he let gone on the U-2 intrusion, calling it a direct provocation and threatening retaliation. However, at the end of his speech, he tempered the blast referring to his commitment to the Leninist principle of peaceful coexistence and to his intention to spare no effort to the Paris meeting to reach agreement. On May 10th, our government received the official Soviet protest, which was couched without any reference to the summit. On May 11th, Khrushchev again spoke with some violence, but noted only his government's intentions to take the case to the United Nations Security Council. Nothing was said of Paris. The next day, TASS assured that the Soviet government felt that the summit conference should take place as planned. Provocation number two. The Pentagon conducted a nuclear test during the summit. An illegal act because of the moratorium declared in 1958 between the US and the Soviet Union. And because of the US energy law of 1954 that prohibits delivery of nuclear weapons to third countries and atomic collaboration with states that do not agree to international inspections, like Argentina. At a U.S. cabinet meeting a few days before his departure for Paris, McCohn presented the physicist Edward Teller and his project Plowshare. It had been agreed in Geneva, McCohn claimed, that the civil use of nuclear explosions should be exempt from the ban. Teller applies pressure. His project should be tested now. At his side, sat George Roderick, Assistant Secretary of the Army and also Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Panama Canal Company. Nobody seemed to be bothered by the fact that in high-ranking officials of the armed forces represented the interests of private corporations inside the government. Roderick calculated the construction costs of a new canal with conventional explosives at approximately $2.25 billion. With atomic explosive devices, a lot of time and money could be saved. The president listened to him with deep interest. On the same day, Herbert York, the highest nuclear weapons developer of the Pentagon, called before the National Security Council for tests of new weapons systems. McCohn reported to Eisenhower a letter from Edward Teller in which he described his new invention, the ditch digger. The combination of reduced fission designs, which already exists with quite deep burial of the explosive, can reduce the radioactivity released to the atmosphere by a factor of 1,000. I have no doubt that Plowshare will ultimately become one of the most important applications of nuclear energy. If we are permitted, go ahead with some of the plans which we have presented to you I expect that Plowshare will become the earliest large-scale economic use of the energy of the nucleus. 
Eisenhower's approval is not included in the files, but... After discussion of the subject, the president ordered all documents be destroyed. What is certain is that a few days later, several nuclear weapons carriers arrived in Argentina. This is mentioned in the report of the Argentine military intelligence. The high-level U.S. delegation traveled to Puerto Belgrano base, where they were received most honorably. The Argentine Navy invited them for a glittering dinner to celebrate the joint project, the construction of a canal to Puerto Deseado with atomic explosives of the Pentagon. The visit of the U.S. military was not handled like a secret affair. On the contrary, on May 12th, only four days before the start of the Paris summit, the newspaper Nueva Provincia welcomed the important guests of the Pentagon and even published their names. Visit of U.S. Marines in Puerto Belgrano. A day later, La Nación announced the arrival of three U-2 reconnaissance aircrafts. The authorities also reported the arrival of four bomb carriers of the type B-57. They will gather information about radiation in our country, wrote Nueva Provincia. On May 16th, as the summit opened in Paris, Herbert York arrived in Argentina. La Prensa published photos of him and his team. Frondizi received him in the government building, and York chatted with journalists. The news about the planned tests must have been read in the embassies in Buenos Aires. However, neither the Russians, nor the British, or the French responded to this provocation. In Paris, the concurrent tests were not discussed. But already on May 14th, a furious Khrushchev arrived and requested an urgent audience with President de Gaulle. At the opening ceremony, he suddenly demanded an apology from the United States because of the U-2 flight and punishment of those responsible. He did not attend the meetings. He did not even hold out his hand in greeting Eisenhower. The atmosphere is icy, communicated German Undersecretary Karl Karstens, satisfied from Paris. The Berlin question had not been touched. Khrushchev has declined even to discuss the issues that were on the agenda. A belligerent Soviet Premier Khrushchev in Paris for summit talks with Western Big Three, Eisenhower, Macmillan and de Gaulle broke off the meeting before it began. In a tirade Khrushchev the boycotted the conference. The he offended the US delegation States. and met outside the city high officials of the French Communist Party. Khrushchev konnte es sich für die Sowjetunion nicht gefallen lassen, dass das amerikanische Imperium über diesen großen Verbund fliegt und hatte einen Propagandaerfolg. Er wollte irrigerweise, dass die USA sich demütig. Darauf hat sich Amerika nicht einlassen können. Mitten im Wahlkampf. Eisenhower hatte die letzten politischen Atemzüge zu absolvieren. Das heißt, Wir treffen auf eine Konstellation, die schier unauflösbar war. Das amerikanische Imperium wollte sich doch dieser kommunistischen Monstermacht nicht in irgendeiner Art und Weise beugen. Man war in der Stadt und war bereit, war nicht bereit. Wäre deutlicher geworden, dass West-Berlin neutral werden sollte oder diskutiert werden sollte und Deutschland einen Friedensvertrag verfasst bekommen sollte. Es ist beides untergegangen unter den Flügeln eines Spionageflugzeugs in der offiziellen Darstellung. McCone was happy. He had prevailed. I stated that under no circumstances should we reach the conclusion that we continue these negotiations. His plan had worked. We were working under a plan to cause Khrushchev and not the president to break off the summit negotiations. Why did the reunification of Germany fail in 1960? This has not even the last president of the GDR understood. Bis kurz, kurz vor der Eröffnung des Pariser Kongresses, äh, der Pariser Konferenz, war Khrushchev noch äh, optimistisch, äh, was das Thema angeht. Und plötzlich äh, ist es alles ganz anders innerhalb von drei Tagen. Ja, diese drei Tage in der internationalen Politik Die kann ich Ihnen auch nicht analytisch beantworten, weil wir in all den Fragen immer noch in Situationen leben, 
wo in der Tat wohl Geheimdienste im Hintergrund eine Rolle spielen, wo es Archive gibt, in denen man bis heute nicht unbedingt in jeder Art und Weise Einsichten bekommt. Das gilt sowohl für die russische Seite bis heute, wie viele Einsichten hätten wir gerne, die wir auch da nicht bekommen für bestimmte Betrachtungen. Und umgekehrt, auch die westliche Seite gibt nicht alles preis, was eigentlich zur wirklichen Wahrheitsfindung nötig wäre. On his return, Eisenhower explained the reasons of the failure of the public with a mystery. Certainly the subjects on which we wanted to talk were those that had seemed so important to them. For example, a disarmament, the widening of contacts so that we would have open societies or slightly more open societies dealing with each other. Then the matter of Berlin and the uh, divided Germany. And finally, as between uh, Russia and the UK and ourselves, some agreement on um, a plan uh, for control of testing. Uh, nuclear testing. Therefore, it was a mystery and remains a mystery as to why at this particular moment the Soviets chose so to uh, distort and overplay the U-2 incident that they obviously wanted no talks of any kind and in fact made it impossible to begin them. But within NATO, in secret sessions, the members asked for the real reasons of failure. The NATO Council must continue the discussion why the summit could not be completed. A reply to the question is necessary. Why the Soviets had torpedoed the conference. But the U.S. did not even inform their closest military allies. Their representatives at the NATO Council passed a single statement of Secretary of State Herder made in the U.S. Senate, and he also talked only about mysteries. He was during the summit in all places accompanied by his foreign minister Gromyko and Marshal Milinowski, and this is very strange. During his visits before in the U.S. and in France, it was important for him to speak alone with the president and with President de Gaulle, only in presence of the interpreters. More revealing is a look at the protocol of the U.S. Security Council. According to these minutes, Khrushchev had calmed down when he left Paris on May 19th and had left the doors open. He waited how things would develop in Argentina. On May 11th, the Israeli agents had entered Argentina from Uruguay with an air taxi from Montevideo to San Fernando. There was only one runway, no customs and no border controls. What they did not know, the plane was registered in Texas and flew for the CIA. Its owner, Lutcher Brown, was a former manager of Rockefeller. On the same day, May 11th, the CIA director Dulles informed Eisenhower's national security advisor. A report of the Argentine Intelligence Service describes the details. Eichmann was transported during his abduction in a vehicle of the office of the president with an official license plate. The Secretary of the Presidency, Samuel Schmuckler, was driving and took him to the house of Marsa Bernet in Acasuso. He was at that time president of the National Bank of Argentina. In May of 1960, Jose Masar Barnet was the head of the Central Bank of Argentina. He had no house in Acasuso. The house in Acasuso belonged to the brother of Jorge Robirosa, president of the National Bank at that time, an influential politician of Frondizi's radical civic union. Before he had been the second in the duel between the party founder, Lisandro de la Torre and Federico Pinedo, grandfather of the current president of the Argentine Senate. Her father was a close friend of Frondizi. He was also his lawyer. Todas las señoras este, del barrio y la peluquería donde iba mamá Eh, consideraron que, 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 que era mala palabra Frondizi porque eh, lo apoyó el peronismo, lo apoyó el Partido Comunista. 
y dejaron de saludarla en el barrio, a mamá. <ríe> dejaron de saludarla porque cuando asumió Frondizi y mi padre tuvo un cargo tan importante como ser presidente del Banco Central, eh, dejaron de saludarla en la peluquería. The Masada Barnett family were Jews and her brother an active communist. En el 60 era el sesquicentenario, nació mi primer hijo. Eh, bueno, hubo un golpe muy grande de los militares porque este, eh, mi hijo nació el 25 de mayo, el día del sesquicentenario de la Revolución de Mayo. Y me acuerdo que papá este, eh, eh, corría del, del, de los problemas de la, de, con los militares al sanatorio a ver a su hija. ¿Qué golpe? <ríe> no lo recuerdo, pero sé que fue uno de los tantos, fueron muchísimos golpes que hubo. No eran golpes eh, definitivos como el que lo, los quitó del gobierno en el 62, sino con atos serían, con atos de golpes. Eso supo muchos, eso lo, todo el mundo lo sabe. Muchos, muchos golpes. Golpes no, eh, con atos. The document of the secret agency also mentions that Frondizi and Bishop Aguirre were aware of all the occurrences. Aguirre received in his official residency the Israeli delegation, and they drank a toast to the agreement that has been signed directly before between Argentina and Israel, and that said that the Jews would not be prosecuted by our courts. Would not be prosecuted. This means for their participation in the Eichmann operation. Today in the Cathedral of San Isidro, Nobody wants to remember these events. Era eh, políticamente totalmente opuesto a Frondizi. Frondizi venía del comunismo, había militado en el Partido Comunista y había pactado con los peronistas para poder acceder al poder, así que él no tenía ningún punto de contacto. Lo único, el único punto de contacto con Frondizi fue que cuando eh, lo, los militares lo sacaron del poder y asumió el poder el que era presidente del Senado, Guido, él sacó una carta pastoral defendiendo la legalidad. The Israeli Foreign Minister, Abba Eban, had come to Argentina on May 19, according to the official history, in order to participate in the independent celebration of May 25th. A document of military intelligence, however, states that the generals were already informed on May 17th of the Eichmann operation. Yesterday, we learned that the former Nazi officer Eichmann had come to the city in 1952 and has received an identity card with the name of Ricardo Clemen. Let's see the dates. May 11, Eichmann does not return to his home. The next day, his son informs the Argentine military. May 11. The Israeli group arrives at San Fernando, Argentina with a CIA plane. May 11, the CIA informs Eisenhower, probably about the discovery of the spies in Argentina as part of a Russian operation. Here, we leave a little space. May 14, Khrushchev arrives very angry in Paris. May 16, the summit starts without Khrushchev. May 17, in Argentina, the military get the news of Eichmann's presence. May 19, the foreign minister of Israel arrives in Buenos Aires and signs a treaty with Argentina. Eichmann and the spies are sent to Israel. It must have been on May 13 that the Argentine security forces, together with CIA, interrupted that operation and put in custody the Argentine and Israeli kidnappers and their prisoner, the Nazi. It was not the first time that CIA took a hostage in order to pressure Khrushchev. The protocol of the U.S. Security Council of May 24th mentioned that in 1959, the CIA had taken two Soviet agents in custody. Ambassador Lodge had said at the U.N. Security Council meeting at the time, Khrushchev was making his disarmament speech before the U.N. last year. The U.S. had taken two Soviet spies into custody. The president believed that as long as a powerful government suspected the intentions of another powerful government, intelligence activities would be carried on. 
I filed a request under the Freedom of Information Act and asked the CIA, the US Justice Department and the FBI if there has been a legal action. I did not get an answer. And all historians that I have consulted did not know of an arrest of two Soviet spies at that time. So it must have been a hostage situation. On May 23rd, Ben-Gurion announced publicly that Eichmann was in Israel and that he would be brought to trial. So, he did exactly the opposite of what he had promised to Adenauer in order to obtain financing of his nuclear program. What happened? Let's go back to the Plowshare program. The Argentine Navy wanted to build a runway for seaplanes near Puerto de Seado. This plan figures in the files, but in reality, it was a plowshare project. The boss of that enterprise was Miguel Asensio, who had served in the engineering corps of the U.S. Army. His last rank before his retirement in early 1960 was lieutenant general. Vine a trabajar acá con la empresa La Texa Udadena Chemical, que eran cuatro ingenieros estadounidenses. Ellos vinieron a una cosa, a verificar cuánta agua iban a juntar con planos hechos. ¿Los planos de, eran de ellos? Eh, claro, planos de ellos. Sí, ellos lo hicieron los planos. Los trabajos después quedaban a cargo de los expertos norteamericanos. Claro. Acá hay un río que pasa debajo de la tierra que lo constatamos nosotros porque yo hice las perforaciones y los tiros de dinamita y saltó el agua, entonces ellos ya sabían que debajo corría un río que venía de la cordillera. On May 12th, the preparatory work was completed, reported the local press. The experts were on the road, among them Herbert York from the Pentagon. Some Marines already were on the Navy base in Puerto Lograno. From there, they shipped their equipment, including the explosive material with the Navy freighter San Bartolomé to Puerto de Seado. According to the logbook, the ship laid in the front seven feet deep in the water, while the rear reached about 14.5 feet. It was loaded with large and heavy equipment and was barely navigable. On May 18th, it arrived in Puerto de Seado. On May 20th, the equipment was arranged and on May 21st, everything was ready for ignition. On May 21st, the tremors began on the other side of the Andes, in Chile. And the next day, the strongest earthquake in the history of mankind occurred. The terremoto de Valdivia was a terremoto extraordinariamente destructor aquí en la ciudad de Valdivia, ¿ya? donde los daños se concentraron, pero fue un terremoto que abarcó no solo la ciudad de Valdivia, sino que parte importante del sur de Chile, desde la región de Concepción hasta la región de Aysén. El nivel del lago se hallaba ya a 13 o 14 metros sobre la... With 9.5 degrees on the Richter scale, the released energy was 20,000 times higher than that of the Hiroshima bomb. Rivers left their riverbed, mountains shifted, and the huge lakes appeared that threatened to wash away Valdivia. The Earth's crust broke up over a length of 1,200 kilometers, all the way down to Puerto Aysén. The volcano Puyehue spewed lava for weeks. On May 23rd, the 10-meter-high tsunami reached Hawaii, Japan, the Philippines, and the west coast of the United States. The devastation was tremendous. Terremotos de ese tipo en Chile, de, de tal magnitud y, y tales efectos, se producen por la colisión de placas tectónicas. Ya en, específicamente aquí se trata de la colisión de la placa de Nazca con la placa sudamericana, en donde la placa de Nazca, eh, que es una placa oceánica, se subduce, se dice, es decir, eh, desciende al enfrentarse con la placa sudamericana haciendo un roce con, con ella se acumula energía se rompen las rocas porque ya no resisten más la acumulación de energía se produce el sismo y la propagación de las ondas en todas direcciones hay terremotos que también son producto de algo humano producido por el ser humano sí no todos los, no todos los sismos son sismos tectónicos o sea relacionados con el choque con el choque de placa Eh, hay sismos volcánicos también, eh, asociados a la actividad volcánica, y hay sismos de origen antropogénico, dentro de los cuales están 
eh, sismos generados, por ejemplo, durante mmm, prospecciones mineras, eh, explosiones nucleares, eh, asociados también a la mmm, generación de cargas en lugares donde no existían estas cargas, me refiero, por ejemplo, grandes represas, eh, en la inyección y extracción de, de, de líquidos del, del subsuelo también. ¿El terremoto del 60 puede haber sido un producto de una explosión nuclear? No, no un terremoto de esa magnitud eh, en ninguna parte del mundo, digamos, porque los terremotos de esa magnitud requieren una acumulación de energía durante, se sabe ahora, siglos. ¿Podrían ser iniciados como la última gota? Bueno, eso, yo no soy sismólogo, pero eso quizás podría, podría haber algún, algún vínculo allí, tal como existen vínculos en, en la... En, el, en, el, en las erupciones volcánicas, en que a veces hay sismos que le dan como el impulso final que faltaba para eh, que se desencadene una erupción volcánica que de todas maneras se iba a producir. Eh, tal, vez, mm, tal vez adelantándola un poco, no eh, condicionando la violencia de la erupción volcánica, eh, pero sí... Eh, mm, estimulándola probablemente en, en, en su aparición. Eisenhower sent his Air Force and gave the Chileans a few blankets and food. He presented himself as a benefactor and hid his nuclear tests on the other side of the Andes. Ich kann mir schon vorstellen, also wenn man wenn man das tatsächlich drauf anlegen würde an Stellen, wo wo so tektonische Platten aneinanderstoßen und man weiß, dass irgendwie in nächster Zeit ein Erdbeben kommt, dass man vielleicht den Zeitpunkt ähm, beeinflussen kann, wenn es einen denn, denn dazu treibt. Das halte ich für technisch möglich. Not even NATO knows if Teller and the Pentagon after May 1960 worked on the development of tectonic weapons. Nein, also ich kann mich an sowas nicht erinnern, habe ich nie gesehen, erscheint mir auch unwahrscheinlich, dass es sowas gegeben hat. Ganz einfach, weil wenn es sowas gäbe, wäre auch, wäre auch ein Einsatz einer solchen Waffe sehr unpräzise und könnte gegen die eigenen Interessen zurückschlagen. Ähnlich wie der Fall bei Biolo Einsatz von biologischen Waffen gegeben ist. Die NATO hatte zum Beispiel keine Probleme und plante auch, ähm, hatte auch Pläne für im Falle eines Krieges chemische Waffen einzusetzen. Ich habe die Dokumente dazu auch gesehen und in den Händen gehabt. NATO, NATO's Chemical Warfare, äh, ein äh, Secret Document. Und, ähm, aber was biologische Kriegsführung betraf, hielt sich auch die NATO extrem zurück, denn äh, man weiß nie, wie sich eine solche, das ist unkontrollierbar. On May 24th, the US Security Council met in the middle of the disaster, a day after the tsunami. Most of these protocols are still classified. Released is only the transcript of a discussion about how the government should behave in the face of parliamentary hearings. It was clear that Congress would insist of some kind of investigation of the U-2 incident and the breakup of the summit conference. Some questions could be answered, but how far officials could go in testifying without endangering our whole intelligence fabric. We thought the story that a NASA weather reconnaissance plane was missing was a good cover story. Mr. Dulles said that we had traced the U-2 piloted by Powers down to 30,000 feet. The president said apparently the pilot had a flight plan with him when he landed. Mr. Dulles said a flight plan was necessary to the operation. The president believed that the pilot did not have to carry the flight plan with him. The president wondered why it was necessary for us to reveal that we had tracked the plane down to 30,000 feet. It bothered him to reveal information of this kind, which throws some light on our intelligence activities. The president said that this was a matter which involved the security of the U.S. 
and the protection of our intelligence operations, and that secret information must not be given out. General Twining believed that an investigation, once started, would seek to explore our whole intelligence operation. He wondered whether there was anything we could do to stop the investigation. He feared that if the investigators probed CIA, they would then want to investigate the JCS operations. The president said Mr. Dulles would reply to say that CIA was a secret organization of the U.S. government. That means the CIA had contact with the plane the whole time and gave the pilot the flight plan so that it was clear that it was not a civil flight, a lost weather plane. They did not even try to cover this espionage operation. It was a pure provocation. The representatives of the five Western powers involved in the disarmament negotiations are meeting on May 30th, and an East-West disarmament meeting is scheduled for June 7th. Secretary Herder believed we would continue to participate in the Geneva negotiations. The president agreed with the views expressed by Secretary Herder, saying that the Soviets, not the U.S., should be the one to make the nuclear test negotiations or the disarmament negotiations futile. Mr. McCone said the nuclear test suspension negotiations differed from the disarmament negotiations in that a mere extension of the nuclear test talks keeps the U.S. in a straitjacket. He felt we ought to press for decisions on nuclear testing. McCone got what he wanted. Proposals for disarmament and world peace would no longer interfere with the interests of the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower thanked the Israeli government for their diversionary maneuver with Adolf Eichmann and Ben-Gurion took advantage of the moment and sent a long wish list to the State Department. Weapons, missiles, and defense systems. Eisenhower paid everything. After years of prohibition, Israel could receive enriched uranium from Argentina. The U.S. government gave the green light for the German financing of the Dimona nuclear plan, which had been agreed in New York in March 1960 between Adenauer and Ben-Gurion a plan to grant the State of Israel after the end of the agreement of reparation during 10 to 20 years an annual loan of $50 million. With this money, Israel was able to build its atomic bomb, as Under Secretary of State Karstens wrote. Defense Minister Strauss has met with Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion spoke of the production of nuclear weapons. By no means could we do anything before the end of the Eichmann trial. Adenauer wanted to wait and see if Eichmann named members of his government as war criminals. Eichmann kept silent at public hearings, and two months later the first payment of 100 million marks was sent to Israel. In January, Eisenhower left office. In his farewell speech, he warned, Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We must not fail to comprehend its grave implication. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. His Republican Party had lost elections. The young Democrat, John F. Kennedy, moved to the White House. Then he visited West Berlin and reassured the population. The status quo of the city was not in danger. At this time, he had accepted the division of Germany into two states. He did nothing when the German Democratic Republic built a wall. 
Kennedy wanted no third world war. Erst in diesem Moment, wo es ein nicht ausgesprochenes gegenseitiges Respektieren der Grenzen gab, war es möglich, eine Mauer in Europa aufzustellen. Vorher wäre es undenkbar gewesen in der Rollback-Phase, wo es darum ging, den kommunistischen Einflussbereich zurückzudrängen. Mit Kennedy kam ein junger, dynamischer, agiler Mann, der zunächst noch einmal an die Rollback-Komponenten ansetzte. Kuba. Der Versuch, Kuba zu knacken. Er ging in die Hose und führte die Welt hauchdünn an den Dritten Weltkrieg. In dem Moment, als sich beide Seiten bewusst waren, jetzt ist es überreizt, war klar, der nukleare Krieg darf nicht die erste Karte im Kalten Krieg werden. Kennedy wanted disarmament and did not allow to be blackmailed by the argument that reducing arms production would mean the loss of power, profits, and jobs. In his speech at the American University in June 1963, he urged the Soviet Union to sign the agreement on an end to nuclear testing. America's weapons are non-provocative, carefully controlled, designed to deter, and capable of selective use. Our military forces are committed to peace and disciplined in self-restraint. Our diplomats are instructed to avoid unnecessary irritants and purely rhetorical hostility, for we can seek a relaxation of tensions. In November, Kennedy was shot. Mrs. Kennedy and her two children, who have, as Bill Ryan... According to the official history, the murder was the act of a single criminal. For most Americans, it was a conspiracy of the Pentagon and the CIA. John McCone headed the agency at the time of the assassination. His arrival at the White House with the courtesies of his title. Eisenhower expressed his condolences to Kennedy's widow, but he never found the courage to speak publicly about his personal experiences with the military-industrial complex. All governments involved maintained silence about what happened in May of 1960, with Israel still using every opportunity to boast about the story of a heroic kidnapping, which was nothing but an embarrassment, but the records maintain classified. The United States also consider the events of May 1960 top secret. When I wanted to see the files of the U.S. National Security Council, they stopped me at the border, marked my passport with the word refused and deported me. Since then, I have been denied a visa. By email, I requested information about York's trip to Argentina. In the National Archives was finally found a single paper. Probably the censors had overlooked it. I requested declassification of the CIA report of May 11. In vain, it remains classified. The Pentagon wrote me that they had no records about the York travel to Argentina. And the Department of Energy sent me some minutes of meetings of the Atomic Energy Commission. But the minutes of May 1960 are not included about York's trip to Argentina, they had nothing in their archives, they said. But the Department of Energy was so kind and directed me to the University of San Diego, where the personal archives of Herbert York are preserved. Among his personal papers were pictures with President Frondizi and his date book. For a small fee, they scanned the pages of May 1960. And there is no doubt, the week from May 15 on was reserved for Argentina. I sent these copies to the Pentagon and the Department of Energy. Look what I found in your archives about York's journey. They never replied. The former government of Christina Kirchner denied me any documentation and prohibited my access to the archives of the border police and the Air Force of Argentina. The people of Puerto Deseado wait until today for a plant that delivers drinking water to the city. 
I sent the more important documents about the U.S. nuclear tests to UNASUR, the South American Security Union, and to the Chilean government. UNASUR maintains silent. I know that Michel Bachelet, the president of Chile, asked Barack Obama for the nuclear testing of May 1916. I asked an interview, but she denied the interview. The real reasons for the failure of the disarmament summit were never published. The German reunification came only in 1990. Why Mikhail Gorbachev did not stick his original demand, German neutrality, has never been explained. Erst am 26. Januar, wir sind jetzt wieder bei vier Tagen, bevor das Gespräch zwischen Gorbatschow und mir stattfindet, hat Gorbatschow eine, die erste wirkliche strategische Diskussion in seinem engsten Führungskreis zur deutschen Frage. Und dann kommen vier Tage später unsere Gespräche, da geht er mit mir mit und sagt, ja, Diese Vereinigung der beiden Staaten muss diese Neutralität des Vereinten Deutschlands mit sich tragen. Und dann wird offensichtlich in den USA, wie Condoleezza Rice, die ja als Beraterin vor allem in den Debatten auf militärischer Seite mit Achomeyev als einem Marschall der Sowjetunion in Malta mit verhandelt hat, die geht am 3. Februar 1990 in die Vorhand und fordert Baker, den Außenminister, auf, man müsse mit der sowjetischen Seite verhandeln, Vereinigung, Vereinigung Deutschlands ja, aber auch in der NATO. Und dann fliegt Baker am 8. Februar nach Moskau, verhandelt mit Gorbatschow und Chevardnadze diese Frage, man einigt sich, Vereinigung wird sein, mit einem nicht neutralen, sondern zur NATO gehörenden Deutschland. Und alles, was Gorbatschow heute im Nachhinein erklärt und sagt, man habe ihn hintergangen, man hätte doch die Frage der NATO-Erweiterung nach dem Osten ihn versprochen, dass es nicht geschehe. Gorbatschow hat nicht ein Stück Papier, auf dem zwischen der NATO und Gorbatschow, den USA und Gorbatschow festgehalten wäre. Die NATO verbreitet sich nicht in den Osten. Es war völlig klar, der Osten ist in dem Moment, wo ein vereintes NATO-Deutschland da ist, für die Erweiterung der NATO frei. Und heute haben wir die baltischen Republiken, wir haben den ganzen Raum, bis zum Schwarzen Meer, der zur NATO gehört. Happy? I don't know. After so many years, you get tired. We thought that in 1960, the Congress would accuse us of having brought the world close to apocalypse. But nothing happened. If they do not know, they cannot ask. The files remain closed. We declassified some things, but nobody was interested. Historians and journalists? Uh, they look at what we give them. And the other governments? You do not live alone in the world. <laughs> what do you mean? This was in 1960, and today, who dares ask? Angela Merkel doesn't want to know how reunification of Germany really occurred. We never forbid her to ask questions, but she never had any questions. Her brain is empty. And the Argentines, whose land was used for nuclear testing? Argentines do not interest us. The government often complains, but when we say shut up, they shut up. And the Chileans? They suffered this terrible earthquake. President Bachelet asked Obama if nuclear testing had been done. She will not want the problems of that answer. Instead, we have offered her a free trade agreement that she will not dare turn down. What about the Russians? They made a serious proposal for disarmament and world peace, and you answered with provocations and abduction of people. Well, 
that's a question you need to ask the Russians. But as you know, Putin is a man of services. He speaks our language. And your own president? What if he asks to see the records? His security clearance does not allow him to see those records. He will take care of himself. He could realize his health reform. That's enough. Do you remember the words of Eisenhower in 1961? He said, at that time, there were three and a half million people working in the military industrial complex. Today, there are many more. Today, our whole economy is a huge military industrial complex. It cannot survive without wars. Do you think we want to lose that business? So, the Ministry of Truth as described by George Orwell, worked. But Orwell did not see something at that time, the internet. With it, people have access to information and can act before falling into another planetary catastrophe. Hmm, well, with the internet we have a little problem, but we're working on it. 